Welcome to the Life Stop 101 podcast, dedicated to sharing stories and insights to inspire you to always make your mental and emotional wellness a top priority. We talk to people who share their personal journeys and experiences, as well as to people who share their professional expertise. And there will also be other times when we share personal tips and stories, which will hopefully somehow spark that aha moment for you too. Because we all have those moments when we think, I wish I had known that earlier in life. That's what Life Stuff 101 is all about. Our discussion today is for general information purposes and not meant to be specific advice. For personalized support and specific answers to questions you may have, please consult the appropriate medical or mental health care professional. Now here's your host who's on this wild adventure ride of life just like you, and yes, a real life person who's actually slipped on a banana peel along the way. Mental wellness coach and psychotherapist, Mio Yokoi. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Life Stuff 101. My name is Mio Yokoi, and it's my goal to inspire you to make your mental and emotional health and wellness one of your top priorities. One of the ways I make my mental health a priority is my lifelong commitment to learning as much about myself as possible so that I can have an awareness of how to take care of myself in the best ways that I can. I mean, I'll be totally honest and say that I don't always do the best job at it, and I'm not exactly always the most consistent at it, but I have a more decent shot at it, and um, it's certainly been more consistent the more data I have about myself at my disposal. The one thing I talk about ad nauseum, perhaps some of you may be thinking, is how much my own personal therapy has literally been life-changing for me. My own personal work has been where a lot of learning about myself has happened. And quite a while ago, um, I would say, I don't know, like a few years ago even, my therapist mentioned to me, um, I think almost like as as a passing thing, about the trait of being highly sensitive. And I remember at the time I heard it, Um, but maybe we're talking about something else or maybe my mind was somewhere else, but I tucked it away in my brain, this idea of having this trait of being highly sensitive, which is often what happens when I learn about new things. Um, and it's been something that here and there with anything that I learn, I'll just kind of like collect things and sort of like learn about it here and there over time. But that has been true of, this idea or this uh, that was uh, presented to me by my therapist, this idea of having a temperament of being highly sensitive. And let me make sure to say this. If you've often thought of yourself as quote unquote too emotional or quote unquote too sensitive or had others often say that about you, or if you find yourself feeling exhausted or overwhelmed with too much stimulation, whether it's because maybe there's just too many people around or um, there's like too much to take in visually or maybe just loud sounds, things like that. It's possible that you're amongst the approximately 20% of the population of folks who possess sensory processing sensitivity. And that's what today's episode will be getting into. So more of those details around that to come. But Sometime in 2018, I watched the movie called Sensitive, The Untold Story, which really resonated with me. And I started really diving into what it means to have a highly sensitive temperament. This has been an interesting and a bit of a a prolonged process actually over time for me, because the more I learned about it, the more I decided that I wanted to have a focus on, in actually the work that I do and and the therapy work that I do is to support highly sensitive folks. So I've been reading, researching, and learning about sensory processing sensitivity for a while now, but my goal has been to be recognized as an HSP knowledgeable professional. So HSP is highly sensitive people or persons. So to be an HSP knowledgeable professional. And that's something that I have been wanting to do now for, I don't know, like over a year. And it's had some bumpy starts and stops. Um, The thing that really had me stalled 
was because I'm in Canada, getting a hold of the of the test materials from the U.S. was pricey, and not that it was actually it, it wasn't actually that it was too expensive. It was actually more about this principle. So I had, and and maybe this is just my own stuff, really, but I had a really hard time pulling the trigger on paying forty five dollars U.S. to get a book or DVD sent here to Canada. Which, uh, by the way, <laughs> after the currency conversion, ends up being around sixty dollars, and it just seemed like a lot of money just for shipping and 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 handling. I understand, but I just had a really big mental block around it. Like the book itself or the DVD itself is,、uh, I think, like forty five dollars or forty nine dollars or something like that, and to pay. The equivalent amount for shipping. It's just like I guess like this this principled part of me just had some difficulties with that. But thanks to my guest today, April Snow, I am now back on track to soon becoming an HSP knowledgeable professional. And the reason for that is that she had actually suggested a few things <laughs> to me where I get either the book or the、uh, the DVDs. That I that I would need to become an HSP knowledgeable professional, and she has suggested some alternate ways of doing that, which actually helped. So <laughs> I really thank April for that number one, but also number two for joining me in my discussion today. So before we dive into our conversation, April is a psychotherapist in San Francisco who specializes in working with highly sensitive introverts. So she knows more than a thing or two about the highly sensitive temperament. But because of the communities and the networks that she has created, she's not only an HSP knowledgeable professional; she's also a very knowledgeable HSP resources <laughs> professional as well. I learned a lot from April about the traits of being highly sensitive, and also her journey to this point of being a highly sensitive introvert herself, but also of being a therapist who serves others. Who are also highly sensitive introverts, and how she's able to get so much done when so many highly sensitive folks can perhaps get overwhelmed by many of the things April has on the go, and I'm certainly one of them. There's so much that's possible to learn about who we are,、um, whether it's about being a highly sensitive individual or other traits about ourselves, and maybe there's something you'll learn today. About being highly sensitive, that will resonate with you, whether it's about yourself or maybe someone in your life. So, please enjoy my insight-packed conversation with April Snow. April, thank you so much for joining me today because I'm really looking forward to learning from you and hearing about your experiences. Not. Just being a highly sensitive introvert, but also as your work as a psychotherapist, and also nurturing community and support for other therapists who identify as being highly sensitive. I'm really grateful that you're doing that work. But before we dive in,、mm-hmm. it could be a total assumption on my part, but I think that there can sometimes be a stereotypes around introverts,、mm-hmm. in particular that introverts are shy、mm-hmm. and perhaps also not social,、mm-hmm. which Is true for some, but not true for all introverts. And further to that, maybe there can also be an assumption potentially that introverts aren't fun, which is yes, uh huh, yeah, which is some, which is someone who. So I identify as a highly sensitive introvert who is shy,、mm-hmm. but I vehemently disagree with that because I think I'm actually quite fun. <laughs> <laughs> but with all that said, I wonder if you'd be open to sharing a fun fact to start us off today. Yeah, I love that. I love that you're already breaking down these misperceptions and these labels because, yeah, introverts can be fun,、um, even when they're shy. Which I also identify as a highly sensitive introvert who is shy, and、um, but still has lots of fun and connects with people. So I was thinking about this question, and I was like, "Well, what is a fun fact about me?" And one that I came up with, which a lot of people always ask me about, is my name. So my name is April Snow, and I always get comments.、Um, I have my whole life, and a fun fact about me is I don't have a middle name. And oftentimes people think that I'm lying, or I'm just embarrassed about my middle name, or they make up middle names for me. I've had all kinds of <laughs> middle names made up for me,、um, and people like to play around with my initials too. Um, and no matter where I go, it's happened to me all over the world. People always make a comment about my name. So when I was little, it was more like 
jokes that like, oh, it doesn't snow in April or this or that. Or now people usually just appreciate my name, which is oddly something I've come to expect. And when I got married, my wife took my last name and now she even gets compliments on her name. So that's interesting. <laughs> I, I was actually thinking too that I, <laughs> I love your name. So it's, it's so lovely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank there, you. And there's something also about it that feels like really visual to me. Oh, yeah. Like I, yeah. yeah, like I guess like mm-hmm. I, I tend to be more visual. So like I almost see like a landscape that's framed mm-hmm. in this beautiful mm-hmm. frame that's on a wall. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And I'm sure that you've gotten like so many different things is feedback about your name. Is there one particular middle name that someone's made up that was notable for you? People love, which has happened all the time, people love to insert different months so April, May, April, June, April, October. That's the classic one. People love doing that. Um, and often I've been called, people will joke and call me different months instead of April. Um, oh. yeah. <laughs> right. So for That's some, the most common, yeah. Right. And so because it's so common, it's, maybe people are feeling that it's creative, but maybe not so much right, for you. Right, exactly. But for me, I hear it a lot. Right. And it's interesting as we're reflecting, I can't help but go deep, realizing that my name is a, is kind of symbolic of self-acceptance because when I was little, I was like, oh, I don't like my name. I just want a regular name. And now it's something that I really love and I feel like helps me stand out. Like even just as you're saying, oh, your name creates a visual, which is so helpful in people remembering my name and you know, helps me as a therapist, I think, stand out a little bit more as I have a unique name. So I've learned to accept it and see it as a, another unique quality about me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And today we are talking about highly sensitive persons, people, mm-hmm. or the trait of having sensory processing sensitivity. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking that for many folks, these concepts are actually new, that they might have not yes. come across these concepts mm-hmm. before. So I was hoping that you can describe what it is and what it's sure. generally like for someone to be a highly sensitive person? Yeah, absolutely. You know, when people hear the word sensitive, there's a lot of perceptions about what it means to be a sensitive person, uh, mostly based on emotion or, or different experiences like that, when there's so much more to it than we realize. So high sensitivity, as you said, is sensory process processing sensitivity. It's an innate trait, which means we're born with it. 20% of the population has this trait. So that's over 1.8 billion people. Um, And it's also found, this is a fun fact too, it's also found in over 100 different species, which tells you it's not something we're making up. It's not something just in women, you know, not something about emotionality. There's an evolutionary advantage to being more aware of your surroundings and to deeply process things. And also the trait is found equally in people of all genders. And 30% of HSPs are extroverts. So we talked a little bit about that introversion piece. Introversion and high sensitivity are often confused when they are separate. And then just keep going. The the main characteristics of the trait are DOES, so the acronym DOES, depth of processing, overstimulation, emotional responsiveness and empathy, and then sensitivity to subtleties in the environment and sensory stimulation. And if you want, I can talk a little bit about how those four characteristics show up. Yeah, because I think that, um, first of all, just as an aside, I Mm -hmm. am convinced that one of my cats is... Yes, right. She is so interesting because imagine that for animals, it Mm -hmm. could be really confusing (laughs) for them. Because this one one cat that I have, there are times when I'd be petting her and she seems confused as to whether she is enjoying it Mm -hmm. or she's Mm -hmm. upset about it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) She can't decide. For the longest time. But she can't decide. Mm-hmm. And so she's growling and purring at the same time Aww. and also rubbing herself up against my leg. So it's so I'm confused as well. So for a long time, mm-hmm. I was like, my husband and I both we were just like, what is up with this cat? But then it just dawned on me, you know, probably a little, like I sh- it should have been something that I should have figured out a long time ago, but that she, I'm convinced that she is. And it's, I haven't looked into it and I really do want to learn a little bit more about how to maybe support her mm-hmm. because I have, I, I have not a clue in terms of how to support animals or cats in this case with, with their sensitivity. Yeah, it's such a good question. If I'm just theorizing here, I imagine it feels good, but maybe it's also overstimulating at the same time because a lot of HSPs, humans have that same reaction to touch. Like it's nice and it feels good, but only to a certain point. And then it starts to feel Mm -hmm. overstimulating. Um, That could be 
with anything with textures or um, people or you know, anything in our environment. Um, sounds and sounds exactly. So you know, being a highly sensitive person means we have a, a brain and a nervous system that's wired to be more perceptive. So we think really deeply, we reflect before we make decisions, you know, we, which means we need more time for transitions, including even little small details like getting out of bed or going from checking your email to opening your mail, whatever it is, you know, we're, we're wired to pause and reflect before we take action. And that's a safety mechanism in us. And we're also big feelers. So we feel everything, the whole spectrum, the whole gamut of feelings really deeply. So that means we feel negatively more intensely, but we also get to feel great joy in the little details. Um, And then we have more active mirror neurons in our brains, which means we have a greater capacity for empathy, meaning we, you know, we tend to notice when someone's upset, we notice the nonverbal cues or, you know, subtle changes in body language, which makes us great partners and friends and therapists and teachers, all of it. Um, and like you said, you know, we're in more impacted by that sensory input, bright lights, strong smells, rough textures and fabrics, um, all of it. And then we notice everything, which means we're more prone to being overstimulated, which I always say is our Achilles heel, right? Noticing everything has a great advantage, but it also in our modern day uh, becomes really problematic if we're not balancing that out with quiet and downtime and self-care, all that. Yeah. And I'm curious to um, for you to, to maybe go into the ac- acronym a little bit more. Oh, sure. Yeah. And because there's, it's, it's great that we're talking about it. Mm-hmm. And I love the way that you um, talked about a lot of the traits or like mm-hmm. a lot of, a lot of what um, is a part of being HSP, but how would you describe, and, and maybe it, it can be a part of the going into the acronyms, mm-hmm. um, some of the more prominent differences between someone who is HSP and someone who isn't? Sure. Yeah. So the acronym that does the DOES, those four characteristics, you're going to find that in anyone who's an HSP, whether um, they're extroverted, they're introverted, they're highly sensation seeking, or they need more novelty, no matter what their gender is. So that's going to be at the core. So there's also a self test which you can take on Elaine Aaron's website. But generally, these four characteristics you're going to see across the lifespan, always present um, in an HSP. So someone who's not an HSP, who's part of the 80%, I'll say, is less impacted by their environment, right? So we're taking in, if you're in a room, you're taking in 100 data points in that room. A non-HSP or someone who's part of the 80% is going to take in maybe 10 data points, right? So they're going to notice the broad strokes. Okay, there's a blue table, there's a brown couch, but the HSP is going to notice, oh, that blue table has a wood grain. It's about three feet tall. It reminds me of this other table I used to have. They're going to, you know, their brains are going to work much more complexly to make connections. So that means, you know, we're needing more time to process and integrate all that information. That's what we're wired to do. The non-HSP, they don't need that, right? They're just going to notice the the general points and they're going to move on to the next thing. So their brains are wired to act first, right? Well, we're wired to reflect first. Um, So there's different advantages to each of those and both are needed. You know, they complement each other. That's great. Yeah. I'm wondering if you could also maybe get into a little bit more. I had this actually question that just left my brain a little <laughs> while ago, but you were talking about mirror, mirror neurons. Can you talk a little bit more about what mirror neurons are? Sure. So mirror neurons are the part of the brain that's responsible for empathy. So when you see someone cry or have an experience, we mirror that, right? So we can imagine ourselves what that would be like. So if you're seeing someone that's upset, you're going to feel those emotions of, of feeling upset for that person. And then you can empathize with them. You can, it helps you support them and, and show up for them. Versus, so ours are much more active than someone who's part of the 80%. So Non-HSPs are still empathetic, right? They still have empathy, but we are much more so, which again, is one of those pieces that's a great strength. And it helps us really be caring and comforting. We tend to be the care, play a caregiver role. You know, a lot of us are therapists or nurses or um, just more conscientious in that way. But on the other hand, if we're doing too much of that, because we're feeling so deeply, we have that wide emotional um, expression, it can feel like a burden, right? It can feel like too much to take on. And we struggle to set boundaries. 
because we often feel guilty. Or it can be, and if there's maybe a, a lack of understanding mm-hmm. of this particular trait in oneself, uh, there's maybe some comparisons. Like how come so, other people can do all of this? Mm-hmm. Or how come my colleagues or my coworkers or my peers seem to be able to do all this and more, and yet I'm exhausted or I am overwhelmed? Absolutely. We're constantly comparing ourselves because we're having a minority experience in the world and often have been told since childhood, you talk about the shy label, so many labels are put on us. You're shy, you're too emotional, you're too slow, whatever it is. And so we we're constantly feeling like misunderstood or not enough and wondering why am I impacted so much, right? Why is this so hard for me? And we can get drowned, you know, we drowned in those, those negative experiences and forget or lose touch of the strengths in the trait. And I really, it it is an interesting thing because uh, many people, um, have, I think, who who are HSPs and maybe, I will just say that. So maybe a lot of people who grow up uh, HSPs and not necessarily have people around them that understand their traits or um, who they are and maybe don't have family members and so forth that can understand or relate. Mm -hmm. Uh, The label of too sensitive Mm -hmm. is a negative one. Absolutely. Yeah. And I like how a lot of um, just going through your website and your blog posts and so forth, which are really great and informative. Mm, thank you. I like that how you talk about sensitivity as a superpower. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I always, I'm always talking about it as a strength to try to, well, one, just highlight the fact that there are so many strengths and help people start to reframe some of their experiences. Because even all those negatives, like you're too emotional, can be turned into a positive. Too emotional can be you're attuned to people, right? You make good decisions because we need our emotions to make decisions. You're, you're emotionally intelligent. You're very attentive. And att- there's so many ways to reframe the negative into a positive. Because oftentimes in our relationships, what's deemed as a negative, there's actually some kind of benefit that's coming to our relationships because we're highly sensitive, whether, you know, we're, we're attentive, we're conscientious, we're, you know, passionate, we're productive, you know, we, we are so immersed in what we do. So oftentimes, oftentimes those get buried. And so I'm constantly trying to help HSPs see that there's so many good things about um, being highly sensitive. We just have to take a little bit better care of ourselves. And in some ways, not compare ourselves as much because, you know, we are having a different experience than most people in our lives, whether they're not highly sensitive or they just don't know they're highly sensitive. You know, I didn't know I was highly sensitive until maybe five years ago, six years ago. Uh, And I was, you know, constantly trying to figure out what's not what's wrong. Well, maybe what's wrong with me and thinking I had to change, but then realizing like, oh, this is something I was born with. And I, I take good care of myself. I can start to thrive and harness the strengths. You know, I was in my control. Mm-hmm. I also think about strengths and weaknesses, um, not just with sensitivity, mm-hmm. but in, in all areas as two different sides of the same coin, mm-hmm. the coin being whatever it is, right? But when, on, on one side, it could be a strength. The other side could be a weakness. That Often our biggest strengths can sometimes also be what can be considered, quote unquote, our biggest weaknesses mm-hmm. as well. But it is understanding so that you can be able to utilize or to, to have a good understanding of what that coin is able to do. Yes, exactly. So that you can, mm-hmm. yeah, so that you can, you can spend it in the best way that you can. Yeah, that's right. I love how you're saying that. I love that analogy of a coin because you're right. It's the same object. It just has two different perspectives depending on what way you're looking at it. And it can change day to day. You know, like for me, my empathy, I always say is my greatest sensitive strength. It helps me do my work as a therapist. I think it makes me a really good therapist and a good partner and a good family member and a friend. But on some days it feels like like a burden, right? It feels like a, my greatest challenge to be so open and um, feeling of what other people are going through. But it's just a matter of, yeah, what which way am I looking at it? So specifically, you just did mention how you experienced being highly sensitive, but can you speak more toward the being a highly sensitive introvert? Sure. Yeah. So like I said earlier, you know, oftentimes introversion and sensitivity are mushed together. It makes sense. 70% of HSPs are highly sensitive. And even the highly sensitive extroverts tend to look less extroverted because they need more downtime so they don't get overstimulated, but they are separate. So introversion just means that your brain favors acetylcholine versus dopamine, right? For pleasure. 
So acetylcholine is released when you're doing inward activities like reading, writing, um, you know, more smaller social gatherings like one-on-one. Um, and then, so introverts, the brain rewards that for you. So you feel content and happy when you're doing more introspective activities versus extroverts are rewarded with dopamine when they're doing social activities, novel activities, or they're putting themselves out there in the world. Um, whereas introverts get over physically overstimulated by too much dopamine. That's why they recharge going inwards. And it's as simple as that, right? Introverts just being more introspective. So introverts who are not HSPs are not having all of those experiences with the does, right? So they're not They're thinking and they're reflecting, but they're not feeling and going in and needing to process and needing to pause and reflect the same way uh, HSPs are. Um, They're not having that heightened empathy. They're not taking in all the details from their environment in the same way. They're not noticing as much. So I think of an introvert kind of, I want to think of a metaphor for this. I don't know. An HSP is just much like a more colorful introvert, if you will. Uh, It's not quite (laughs) right, but um, there's more complexity when you're an HSP introvert. Uh, Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah. So for people who are thinking, like they may be listening to this Mm -hmm. and and thinking like, oh, like I wonder if I might be an HSP. um, What would um, you suggest in terms of how they might go about finding out if they are or not? Sure. So the best way is to go to Dr. Elaine Aaron's website. It's hsperson.com. There's a self-test there. It's a re- There's lots of quizzes and checklists online for HSPs, but this is the only one that's research-based. So it's a 27-point yes or no t- self-test, and it pulls out different qualities of the HSP. And that's the, really the way to start to, to reflect. Of course, there's nothing definitive, um, but that's a, a great way to see, you know, do I relate with a lot of these characteristics? And then you can also look at the does. Like, do you see those four characteristics showing up um, in your life, right? Throughout your life, lifetime. But the self-test is a great way to start. Great. And that's in, that's on Dr. Aaron's uh, website. Yep. HSperson.com. And you'll see a tab for the self-test. There's one for adults and one for children. And I'm curious to know, though, if you can speak a little bit more about Dr. Erin and her work. Sure. Yeah. So Dr. Erin, she's a psychotherapist and a researcher. She's essentially the founding researcher of this trait, although it's been studied in other ways using different terms like passive or things like that. But she's the one that coined the phrase. Actually, I think her therapist, she talks about this in the documentary, Sensitive, The Untold Story. Her therapist happened to say the word and she's like, oh, what is that? And so she started studying or doing research in Santa Cruz, California, I think in the early 90s. Uh, and she thought she was studying introversion because she was trying to figure out why do I feel so much? You know, I'm thinking so, so much. So she thought she was studying introversion and then realized it was a different trait. Um, and then her husband is also a researcher. So together they did fMRI scan- scans and they did all this research. And eventually she put the book out, her first book, A Highly Sensitive Person, out in 1996. She's written many books since then. She continues to do research to this day. Um, she continues to teach. Um, she's very prolific. Um, and she's been on the forefront of making sure that this trait is, people know that it's valid. That's, you know, at the heart of her life's work. And she's still working tirelessly towards it. Making sure that people know this trait is real. It's not something we're making up, right? It's not just about emotionality. It's the depth of processing. You know, and there's so many researchers now that have picked up and validated her original research all over the world. It's amazing. Um, like Michael Pluse and Jay Belsky. And there's just so many people now that are um, creating more validity for us as HSPs. It's great. And when you... It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm only really scratching the surface and finding out um, about her work and the research that she's been doing. Mm-hmm. But was that your entryway into learning more about being a highly sensitive person as well? So I am not a researcher. I'm a therapist. Um, so I tend to be more on the clinical side where she's more on the research side. And I actually found out about the trait in grad school when I was studying to be a therapist. And one of my classmates happened to mention it. So I was really lucky to be able to specialize in working with folks that have the trait early on, which doesn't usually get to happen. So I was able to specialize from the beginning of my therapy practice. And now I only work with HSPs. Um, So yeah, I'm doing it more from a clinical standpoint. And thankfully, I've gotten opportunities to 
well, Dr. Aaron has come to retreats I've organized and I've been able to go to events that she's taught at and just really soaking everything up like a sponge, you know, reading the research, even though I don't conduct research, just reading and familiarizing myself with it and helping my clients understand themselves and then putting my own perspective on it for my own life experiences and clinical experience. And yeah, there's just so much. It's it's just a, if people are interested, the research is also on Elaine's website if they're interested in diving a little bit more deeply into it. But you can also get the basics through her books. So that's so fascinating that for you, it was through a classmate, not necessarily Word part of, mouth. of the curriculum. It's true. Yeah. yeah, not in the curriculum at all. And that's one of the reasons why I started a highly sensitive therapist community online and I put out blogs and do retreats because there's so little awareness. Even though there's so much research, it's relatively new, right? Over the past 25 years or so. So even... Even established clinicians that know about the research still sometimes say, oh, well, it's this or that. And they, they try to lump it in with, with something, you know, another diagnosis. When really, in reality, it's a trait and it's been validated. There's still work to be done uh, for this trait to be well known in the therapist community. So that is at the heart of my mission to do my work is just making sure it's known and educating therapists and not just for themselves, but for their clients too. Because when you're in therapy, if your therapist doesn't know about the trait, that could be a big missing puzzle piece. You could be doing mm-hmm. so much for your own healing process, but if you don't know that there's something, another layer, you're not going to make the progress that you could otherwise. Because sometimes things are it's so true. are simple. So if you're presenting that you have ADD, you could just be overstimulated and then making a few lifestyle changes that those symptoms go away. It's so true. There's, you know, people that I either come across in my work or even just personally mm-hmm. who would say I lack focus issues. I must be, right. maybe I'm on the, you know, the ADHD or ADD spectrum or something like that. Mm-hmm. And sometimes if I know that person a little bit, I will just maybe question, you know, it's like maybe the, it isn't necessarily an attention deficit issue. Mm-hmm. It's maybe an overwhelm issue right. or an overstimulation issue. It's so true. And, mm-hmm. and I have talked to other other clinicians who aren't aware of high sensitivity. And uh, the, I think the more that people do understand and are not just people, but specifically therapists and, and, and folks who work in the mental health professions, mm-hmm. for them to be aware, I think that, yeah, uh, it, it would be really, really helpful. Yeah, it's true because, you know, someone could come in and present as having ADD or, you know, just dis- decision making issues. And that could be, yes, they have ADD and that's it. Or they could be an HSP or they could be an HSP with ADD. You know, there's so many Mm. layers to it, you know, because mental health and other issues are separate from temperament. Um, So we have to really, it gets complicated, but it's, it's, it's important to start to at least pick it apart and consider um, personality traits in the presenting issues. And and thank you for making that distinction, because sometimes I think um, many people, when they think about mental health or mm-hmm. perceived problems mm-hmm. or challenges that they have, they can go to a binary. Like, Absolutely. You know, like, Tell me what this is, right. you know, as opposed to there's a complexity mm-hmm. as, as who we are as human beings. There are so many different variables and so many different things that could be a part of why we may have certain challenges or why uh, there are different things that we may be experiencing that might not be understandable and so forth. Absolutely. I mean, just think of it. So even just with the sensitivity piece, that's one thread. There are so many other threads based on like culture and gender and spirituality and family of work. There's so many intersecting yeah. layers. So you talked about how um, from the clinician side, Mm -hmm. um, you you as a therapist, you work exclusively, did you mention, with highly sensitive folks? I do. Yeah. At this point, that's why people reach out to me. Um, So Mm -hmm. all the people in my practice are, are HSPs at this point. It's been a slow progression, but yeah, that's, that's at the focus of what I do. And I wonder if you can describe what it's like to be a psychotherapist and to possess Mm. high sensitivity. I'm sure that there is also a difference in working with HSP folks being HSP yourself as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, Elaine talks about this too, but a lot of my colleagues as well, that HSPs can be really dream clients because they are they love the work. They love to go deep. You know, they're really focused on self-growth and self-awareness. They're very conscientious, so they tend to show up on time and um, not miss sessions. So they're really committed to the work. And that's a generalization, of course, but I would say that's relatively true with my clients. Like I see 
people for a long time. They come every week. We get to do some really rich work, which as an HSP myself makes me feel really fulfilled um, in what I do because that connection is really magical and I get to see people grow and change. And I, you know, it's just an incredible experience. And on the flip side, being an HSP, or I like to call it an HST, a highly sensitive therapist, being an HST comes Mm -hmm. with its challenges as you can probably relate to, it can be hard to sustain the deep work that we do, being more empathetic, being more perceptive. We're taking in so much. I know my own therapist once said to me that it looks like we're not doing much from the outside if you observed us doing our work, but on the inside, Mm -hmm. every part of us is engaged, right? So it takes a lot of energy to show up and be fully present for people. It's incredible work, but it also can be draining. Um, and I see a lot of therapists struggling with energy and o- energy issues and overwhelm. And can you talk more about the community building and the support that you have for HSTs? Sure. Yeah. So a few years ago, I was feeling in need of community myself um, as I was going through my own exploration about being highly sensitive and wanting to build more community around that. So I started a Facebook group. And then that has turned into a group now. I think we have almost 2,500 therapists in there from all over the world. Um, wow. Yeah, it's incredible. Just the space in there is very special and people comment how supportive it is. And it, it feels different than other therapist groups because we, we get each other and we can ask these deeper questions and really show up in a different way, be more vulnerable and authentic. Um, and then that therapist or that you know online group has turned into, I do a monthly gathering in Oakland in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, yoga gathering. So we get together three hours a month. We do yoga, we talk, we, you know, do all kinds of wonderful work together. And then also I do an annual retreat for therapists. So two years ago, it was in Santa Cruz. Last year, it was in upstate New York and just spending, you know, four days together, really connecting and supporting and learning. So it's been an incredible process building this community and feel really grateful for it because, you know, one of the things we need to thrive is being in community, especially as HSP, so we can realize we're not alone. And there's another layer of being a therapist and being an HSP. It's a very unique experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The thing that I'm struck by, though, mm-hmm. is that you being an HSP and an HST uh-huh. and the amount of work it feels like uh-huh. that you're engaged in <laughs> yes. that that as much that as much as having community and building a community um and uh, feeling a part of a community is is essential mm-hmm. crucial and so important mm-hmm. but i'm i'm just struck by goodness that is a lot of work for you <laughs> i get this question a lot <laughs> i've had mm. people say oh you make us look bad as an hsp because you do a lot mm-hmm. um and you know there, i think there's a couple components one yeah it has been a lot of work Work. And it's work that I love doing. So it, even though it can be draining, there's a simultaneous fulfillment happening. So I think it kind of evens out and is less draining overall. And at this point, the group pretty much runs itself, right? Everyone is so wonderful. You know, for a group that size, I'm very fortunate that rarely do I have to intervene or, you know, do anything. People are just supporting each other and it, it, it's just its own alive being. It's amazing. And I have lots of help. Um, I have a lot of do. I have a lot of things that are automated. Um, so, like I do online scheduling. All my social media is automated. You know, I batch it together. I have people help me with things. You know, there's just it's not just me. And mm-hmm. like, even my yoga gatherings that I do once a month, I I have a partner, my Shauna Do, who does that with me. She's a fellow therapist and a yoga teacher. When I did the retreat, I've had lots of people. You know, you know, doing that with me. So, it's not just me. It's been a process of developing really good systems, really good, you know, routines. So I'm taking away a lot of that decision making Mm -hmm. and automating as much as possible. So like I have templates for all my standard emails. So I have online scheduling for my clients. You know, I don't do any scheduling direct. They do it all online. I have standing appointments for everybody. So yeah, there's just a lot of little hacks and things that I've, I've made easier for myself. So the 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 curious part of me mm-hmm. um, is wondering whether or not um, your ability to be able to organize and to systematize mm-hmm. um, sort of maybe chicken and the egg thing, yep. I, I guess, kind of a question. Yep. Is is that, do you think, a, a trait, like a natural kind of a trait that you have? Or do you think that it, it's come as a result of needing to manage? It's it's something I have. So I, I am naturally an organized person. Um, I love creating systems. I, you know, my previous life working as a manager for small business, and then I managed a nonprofit um, during my grad school time. 
So I'm, I, yes, I'm kind of naturally organized and I like creating systems and kind of taking a mess and making it streamlined. So yeah, that's, that's definitely an advantage for me that I have. And I know not all HSPs have that. So that could be um, a barrier for some folks, right? Setting up those systems. Is it something that you're able to teach, do you think? It's something I've thought about, whether or not it's something I wanted to share with other therapists. I'm not sure. I think I could, definitely could teach it. Yeah, I think I think it's an interesting thing. Yeah, I definitely mm-hmm. I definitely could. You know, I like teaching. Um, I definitely could share my routines and spreadsheets and all that. Yeah, I think it could be taught. I think what's interesting, right, is that some folks, I think, will just knowing who they are, mm-hmm. knowing their own tendencies or traits, figure out how to manage, right? Yeah. And um, it's like, well, this is what works best for me. So this is what I'll, what I'll I think will work mm-hmm. um, in order to sustain me or to, to support me and so forth. I th- and I think that there are some folks, um, as I think you just described, that are just naturally like able to kind of put things together right. and have things make sense mm-hmm. and to be able to systematize or to mm-hmm. um, be more process oriented and yep. so forth. It's just a, a thought more than anything mm-hmm. else, but I I am curious about that, right? Like the idea of for folks who do have the trait of being able to notice so many things mm-hmm. and so many details, mm-hmm. but then maybe not to have that also that natural trait of not being able to organize it. It's true because you know there's yeah for HSPs there's you know there are big pieces around creativity and some of that can just you can get into more of like a I'm I tend to be pretty linear but you can get into like a cyclical process and I want to say you know my way works for me but there may be a way that works for some you know another way that works too like I remember being in grad school and you know, I take my notes in a very kind of organized fashion but some people instead of writing notes they would be drawing and that was very meaningful for them and I know a lot of HSTs that you know process through art where I process through writing or um, meditation or things like that. So yeah, I, I want to honor that you may have a different system, but it may work for you still, even if it looks different. Yeah. Yeah. That feels important to say. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's, it is definitely that we all have different ways of just because the, the traits in and of themselves may be similar mm-hmm. to what people are experiencing, mm-hmm. but how we manage them and what we need in order to be able to do that and all, all that could be very, very unique and individual. Yeah. And also there's a piece, cause I see this a lot where HSPs, I used to run groups a lot and they, you know, some people are like, I don't know if I fit in with this group because, you know, I don't match up in this way or that way. And I'm like, we're all different and it's okay. And you still get to be under the HSP umbrella. You know, we spend so much time comparing ourselves or not feeling like enough. Like I want all HSPs to feel like, yeah, you're in this community, right? Because it's just one small part, not maybe not small, it's one part of us. Um, and so there's lots of room for variation. And even amongst those differences, there's some research done that even cross-culturally, HSPs from different cultures will connect and understand each other more than non-HSPs from the same culture, which is pretty profound. Mm. So there's so much room to be different and still be in this community as an HSP. Mm -hmm. Just to uh, maybe take a step back in Mm -hmm. terms of that, that thought that I had around you being able to do, or you just uh, having, having Mm -hmm. done a lot, do a lot. Yeah. Uh (laughs) Yeah. And so for you specifically, I'm curious to know um, what some of your self-care, I guess, would be. So um, this is something that I, that I spoke to you about before we started recording, but for instance, in advance of, or in preparation for maybe doing this kind of a recording, for instance, is there something Thing that you might do for yourself or engage in before and afterward as a self-care thing? Yeah, definitely. You know, I think a big part of it is giving myself time to process. Um, so you had, which I'm so grateful for, you sent me all, you know, some of the questions ahead of time. So I would be able to start to feel into what the interview might or this conversation might feel like. Um, and that's really helpful. So in preparation, I looked through the questions. I did some writing and reflecting about how I might want to answer those questions. You know, what would feel the most important to say? You know, listening to a few episodes right before so I could get a sense of your rhythm. Um, so starting to imagine myself in the process has been really helpful. And, you know, that's just leaning into that natural instinct to feel prepared, right? To process before engaging that we have, in our, you know, as HSPs. And then also giving myself right before, like right before we were going to start, you know, a little bit of time for quiet. So I'm coming in feeling refreshed. I'm not feeling um, rushed, you know, making sure I had food and 
it just felt like I was taken care of before. And then after I'll do the same thing, right? Give myself time to process like, oh, what did that feel like? Um, was I happy with what I said? Would I have changed anything? You know, just giving my, my brain time to uh, integrate the experience and then probably take some downtime because, you know, we're going to probably be together about an hour or so. And that takes energy for me as a HSP and an introvert. So make, you know, knowing myself mm-hmm. enough to integrate that in. And as a therapist, I do the same thing. You know, I, I leave 30 minutes on both sides of every session. And I just know that that's what I need. Do you feel having an understanding and awareness of yourself mm-hmm. in this way that you're always being conscious or that, that you're very intentional mm-hmm. always? Mm-hmm. Or do you find that there are times when certain things might sneak up on you, for instance? Oh, yeah. and, 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 if, and if that's the case, how do you notice that that's happened? Mm, that's a good question. Yeah, I would say I'm much more intentional than I ever was, you know, just having done a lot of therapy and self-work, um, self-awareness work. But yeah, things can sneak up on me. You know, as HSPs, we don't like so those surprises because uh, we didn't get the chance <laughs> to prepare and it can be stressful and it can like activate our um, our nervous systems. Uh, but yeah, I would say it definitely happens from time to time, although I, I try to prevent that as much as possible. And I think a lot of it too is I'm intentional, but at the same time, I don't know, I've created systems for myself or routines for myself so I don't have to be as intentional. I've kind of like set things up for myself, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Do you mind sharing me maybe what some of those things might be on a more of a routine basis? Yeah, sure. So like, for instance, setting up my work, ske- like constantly, you know, checking in with myself, but, you know, establishing a work schedule that work that is really supportive for me. And I know I, you know, running my own practice, I get to do that. And that's, that's such a privilege, but that really helps me. So I have the same schedule every week. And then I have certain days that I do different activities. So like, for instance... You're doing laundry on the same day. I I do batch cooking on the same day every week. I grocery shop on the same day. I have a day every week that I take just for me and I rest and recharge. So those are just built in. I don't have to think about it. Right? I don't have to. Mm-hmm. It is intentional, but I like I would set the intention and just like let it go on autopilot. And that's really helpful because we get decision fatigue as HSPs. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. Because I was the the follow up question that I had to that mm-hmm. was, do you think about it as managing stimulation? Mm. Um, but then there is also that piece around decision making. Yeah, I think it's yeah. I had mm-hmm. actually not thought about. I think that. it's both because too much decision making can be overstimulating. Right, I'm, right. I'm sure you felt that where it's like I, I just can't think. Like when I'm tired, I can't think about where to go to dinner or what I need to do next. I'm just so tired. My brain is wants to shut off. Yeah. So part of that is, well, I could see it from a f- couple of different perspectives. Part of it is, you know, reducing the overstimulation from making the decisions themselves, and you know, saving that energy for something else. And then a lot of that is making sure I don't get overstimulated. So you know seeing less clients a week is helpful for me as an HST. That's manages overstimulation. Taking that rest day every, you know, one day a week manages overstimulation because I get to fill my tank back up. Um, There's so many ways because the overstimulation piece is the hardest piece in my experience and what I hear from others about being an HSP. We get overstimulated so easily because especially in today's world where everything is busy and loud and mm. with our smartphones and there's everyone's constantly dinging us through email and texts and it's just a lot. So we need to... And, and for those of us who live in larger cities as well. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's so true. You, there's a need to be even more intentional about that. Mm-hmm. I um I had a question <laughs> and it just escaped me again. Uh-huh. But let me ask you and to go back to oh actually it's it's in regards to the knowledge that you have or the support that you that um you you provide for HSTs. Mm-hmm. I know that um one of the one of the ways in which you talk about it is how uh, we as therapists can get into this comparison piece, mm. just, just like I yeah. think that we can as HSPs For sure. um, in, in relation to the 80%. Mm-hmm. Um, can you talk about like ways in which HST, so um, highly sensitive therapists could be, find themselves in comparison to maybe non-HST For colleagues? Sure. Uh, that's a great question. I think the biggest one that I see, I see it so much, is how many clients we're seeing per week and what is a, su- a successful practice. So this is such a common conversation I see all all the time. You know, I think that's the marker 
for success. Oh, do you have a full caseload, right? It's not even necessarily about the money. It's the client caseload number. And typically, although I, you know, this ranges so much, typically people will say like, oh, 20 to 25 in private practice. Some people see a lot more than that. And if you're in an agency, it's even, you know, even more often. So HSTs, I consistently seeing, I consistently see saying, you know, 10 to 12 is an ideal number. And that varies. Some people less, some people more, but the median, if you pulled HSP, HSTs and I have is 10 to 12 clients a week. That feels sustainable energetically. And a lot of people, can't, HSTs can't see more than that and feel energized and feel you know in tune with their empathy and show up as their best selves. Um, so it's a matter of figuring out how to do that. That's like the number one thing is like how you know, how many clients am I seeing? And then how am I feeling when I see those clients? So a lot of HSTs are only seeing 10 to 12 a week, not only, but they're seeing 10 to 12 a week. And they're like, why am I more tired than someone who's seeing 30 clients a week? And that's really hard to sit with when you're seeing less Mm -hmm. clients, but you're feeling worse. Yes. And this idea too of what quote unquote a successful practice is. Right. It's so subjective. Um, as, as though, yeah, as though it is objective in some way. Right. It's not. Mm. It's so different. I mean, that's the beauty of our, our field. And I love it so much that every therapist, you know, within ethical and legal guidelines can create their own way of doing it. It's beautiful. Yeah. And the fact mm-hmm. that we can all individually have an idea of what that successful practice yes. is. It's, it's unfortunate that we do get into that trap yeah. sometimes of, yeah. What are, what are other people doing? And they seem to be doing so much. Exactly. Kind of it's like, who cares? As long as you're supporting yourself and you love your work, that's all that matters. And I've seen mm-hmm. people support themselves with six clients a week. And I've seen people support themselves with 30 clients a week, right? It's all, it's so right. different. And it, you know, it also depends on what else you're doing. So Sometimes you can see 10 to 12 clients a week, just that. And other times maybe you're doing something else like teaching or supervising or doing consultation or groups or, you know, there's so many other ways um, to make a practice work. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I would imagine that through the the community that you've built Mm -hmm. um, and helped sustain that you see so many different ways in which people. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many variations. It's amazing. It's so inspiring. And I, and I think that is also the beauty of private practice too. Mm -hmm. Um, there are, of course, folks, folks who work in institutions Mm -hmm. or in agencies and so forth, but that for those of us who are in private practice, there is that level of flexibility to be able to have, yeah, to make those decisions that are best for us. Absolutely. So if you want to not start seeing clients till 12 or 2 PM, or you only want to see three or four clients a day, or you want to take a, you know, two hour lunch break, whatever that is, you get to do that. It's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Speaking specifically about your clinical work, though, mm-hmm. I'm wondering about the ways in which you work with HSP clients. Mm-hmm. I kind of were asked sort of a similar question earlier, but do you think that there is a specific way of working with, with folks who are highly sensitive? I don't actually, you know, because we're all so different. It, there's been a lot, you know, I, I hear a lot from um, therapists that they want like one way to work with HSPs, but because we're all so different, I think it's more important just like you would, you know, anyway, just find the right fit because a lot of, you know, Mm. there's going to be a lot of variation in what people respond to based on their background, based on their interests, based on just their own style of processing, whether they're extroverted, whether they're high sensation seeking, whether they have trauma in their background, whether they don't. Um, So there's a wide variety. I think just generally speaking, therapists just knowing about the traits thinking about their envi- the environment of their office, thinking about consistency and, and holding boundaries, just kind of some of the basics might fall mm. across the board. But as far as style and theories, uh, I think it's, it's going to run the gamut for HSPs. Yeah. Um, and I'm also curious to know if there's a difference between working with children versus adults. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just, I guess, in my experience of noticing that there are a lot of parents who yes. learn about being HSP through their their children and then realizing, oh, like maybe that's that's me too. Absolutely. Um, so I think, no, it's funny you say that because I hear that so much people saying, I learned about the trait because I was doing research for my child. And then they realize, oh, I'm a highly sensitive person too. Yeah, it's so common. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so with that, and I know that you work with children mm-hmm. as well as adults. Mm-hmm. Do you do you find that there is a difference in the way that you work with children versus adults? Oh, definitely. So generally, just you know, being it more experiential, more play based, more you know, bringing in more art and creativity. I do a little bit of that with adults, but it's it's much more 
prominent in my work with children. So if you came to my office, I have lots of art supplies and like sensory objects and books and all kinds of of things. And because with HSP kids, you know, a lot of HSP kids are very responsible. They're very perfectionistic. They they tend to be little adults. So I Mm. like to create an environment that's, of course, consistent and safe but where they have a little bit more autonomy and they can make decisions and they can engage more in play than maybe what they're doing outside in the world. Mm. Yeah, I find that that's really helpful for them. And of course, you know, it's not, it's not a, I don't want to make a generalized statement just from my own experience. That's been my focus. That's interesting that you mentioned uh, children being like little adults. So, yeah. so children who are high sensitivity. Cause what's, what's your sense of... Cool, because, you know, we're so conscientious. They're, they're, you know, the HSP kids, they tend to be, they tend to be kind of the emotional sponge for the family, right? Because they're noticing everything and they, they, they're noticing a lot, oftentimes more than the parents are noticing if the parents aren't HSPs. Um, and then they're matching what people expect of them. So parents expect them to be, you know, perfect students. That's what they are. Um, or perfect athletes, that's what they're going to be. But that comes at a cost. You know, everything on the outside looks great. But then when you start to dive in, there's a lot of anxiety and sleep issues and perfectionism. And like, it's, you know, you know, a pretty much strong developed inner critic, which you'd be surprised to find at that age. Um, mm. So just trying to give them a place to set down that perfection, get a little bit messy, you know, get playful, um, have, have some more age appropriate exploration. Mm-hmm. Somewhere to put that stress. It, yeah, so it's so true that the idea of highly sensitive children or even kids who are maybe highly intelligent Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. and also uh, maybe even within the gifted realm and so Mm -hmm. forth is that adults can mistake them as being adults or more mature than they actually they are Uh, but they're still children like even though they have this ability and they have so much awareness but yet they're still children and they have the emotional needs of, of kids and that is that is such important work to to be able to allow children to express themselves as children and not always just to feel like they needed to be little adults. Yeah, that's right. You know, because being an HSP, you're much, you know, tend to be much more emotionally aware and expressive. So, you know, they can seem, a lot, oftentimes they're more emotionally intelligent for their age. And, a, you know, the parents can forget that they're, you know, they're much younger than they are. So that, you know, often involves a lot of psycho ed with the parents. And sometimes even bring, mm-hmm. I like to bring parent and child together and, you know, practice communication and practice validation and support and really listening, like, and also kind of tuning into some of the subtleties that the child is expressing that the parent might be missing, mm. helping them see that. That's so great. And I am um, aware of our time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and thank you so much for, for doing this. Yeah. I really appreciate it. A few questions to uh, three, maybe more questions just to, uh, to end off. Would that be okay? Yeah, yeah, of course. So um, for those of the people listening, and they do decide um, that uh, they go to Dr. Aaron's website and maybe take the self test and um, you know, they either may already identify as HSPs or suspect they may be HSPs. What are some suggestions or tips that you may have for that, for those folks? Sure. So yeah, definitely the, f- the most helpful starting point is learning more about yourself as an HSP. That's going to be really important because if without that self-awareness, we're never going to take care of ourselves. We're never going to prioritize ourselves, advocate for ourselves. So that's at the forefront of our process of um, taking care of ourselves as HSPs and being able to thrive. So that could be reading uh, Elaine Aaron's books. That could be going to her website, diving into the research, which not everybody will resonate with, or watching the documentary, Sense of the Untold Story. That's a great, um, accessible way to learn about the trait. You can find it online. And then, if possible, surrounding yourself with people that are HSPs, or at least you can feel like you can be yourself with, right? Where you're not holding back or or editing yourself, that you can feel be your fully expressive version of you. That's going to be really important. That's um, essential piece to accepting yourself. Do you find that HSP communities are there are more of them? Um, because, like you were saying, it's a it's a relatively new mm-hmm. area of awareness that people have about this particular trait. Like you were saying, twenty or twenty five years or so. Mm-hmm. Do, are you are you finding that there there are more and more communities? Yeah, there's a ton of meetups. So if you go to meetup.com, there's lots of local meetups that so you can just type in your city or area. Um, there's online groups, you know, Facebook groups. Um, 
if you go to Dr. Aaron's site, hsperson.com, she does a few HSP gatherings each year. So at 1440 in Santa Cruz, California, at Cropalo in Massachusetts, and some others as well. Jacqueline Strickland has an a biannual, so twice a year HSP gathering, one in the US and one internationally. Uh, you can look for that as well. That's also in the events section on Elaine Aaron's website. So yeah, there's definitely more and more and more um, opportunities to connect. And then, you know, you could also start your own meetup if that's something you're willing to do. But there are already a lot in place. So I would start by checking first. That's great to know. Yeah. And you mentioned Dr. Aaron's book. Are there any other books or resources that you would recommend? Yeah. So yeah, definitely her books. I love, she has another book, which is not directly uh, written for the HSP, but I find really helpful. It's called The Undervalued Self. Um, it's really wonderful about reclaiming our strengths and, and learning to advocate for ourselves. I love it. It's, it's got lots of practical tools and exercises that you can work through. It's a great tool for self-exploration. I really love that. That's fantastic. So I call this or decided to call this podcast Life Stuff 101 mm -hmm. because there are constantly things that I am learning throughout mm -hmm. my entire life and still keep learning where, you know, every so often I go, hmm, you know, if this is something that I had maybe come across earlier in life or maybe even been taught in school mm -hmm. or something like that, that it could have been just really good to know. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know uh, what um, that would be for you if there is a good to have known life lesson that maybe would have been nice for you to have known earlier? Yeah. You know, the biggest one for me is that there's nothing wrong with being quiet, being more introspective. You know, it's actually a strength to be perceptive and aware of the world around you. You know, there's value in noticing all the little details and picking up on body language, thinking and reflecting before making a decision. There's there's so much strength in that. And that's something that I never knew before. And it really, without that self-acceptance, it really framed how I thought about myself. And I was constantly working to change myself. Whereas now... I'm at peace with who I am. And I know that it's it's what I was born with. It's how I am. And it's also exactly um, okay to be this way. And I wish someone would have told me that sooner. Mm, that's so great. Thank you so much, April. Yeah, um, you. This was a really great conversation. I really appreciate that you're you know, doing the work that you're doing, working with highly sensitive folks, as well as highly sensitive therapists. And for spreading, I guess, the message and the experiences of being yeah. a highly sensitive introvert. Where can folks learn more about you and the work you do? Sure. So whether you're an HSP or a therapist, you can find everything at aprilsnowconsulting.com. Great. Thank you so much, April. Thank you. I really appreciate you opening up your platform for me to, to share this information. I hope you really enjoyed that conversation I had with April because I, I really certainly did. And it was a great pleasure for me to speak with her. And again, you can learn more about April at aprilsnowconsulting.com. There you can reach out to April to work with her in therapy. If you're in the San Francisco area, identify as a highly sensitive introvert and interested in exploring psychotherapy. Or if you're a highly sensitive individual who works as a helping professional, April also has a very supportive and engaged highly sensitive therapists community on Facebook. And you can she also has a ton of resources as well, which you can also find through her website at aprilsnowconsulting.com. These links will be in the show notes. And I also hope to bring you more details about the highly sensitive temperament as I'll be diving deeper into it in my own work. And as a side note, I'll be launching a new site of my own where you can learn more about my focus on working with HSPs. If you'd like to be notified of updates, please head on over to lifestuff101.com where you can sign up for updates. And while you're there, you can also listen to past episodes like my conversation with Debbie Brady, the author of The Depression Survival Guide. And if you're curious to learn more about the connection between sleep and your well-being, there's also another great conversation that I had with Dr. Ishan Su, who is a psychologist and a sleep specialist. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's my hope that these wide-ranging discussions about mental health and personal development contain nuggets of learning and information which can help you to know and think about yourself differently. Because in the words of psychologist 
William Schutz. He said, "As my awareness increases, my control over my own being increases." I think that's pretty amazing. And on that note, I hope you're having a lovely morning or evening wherever you are in the world. And I look forward to talking to you again real soon. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Life Stuff 101. If you haven't already, please subscribe so that you'll be among the first to be notified when new episodes are released. Always be sure to check out lifestuff101.com for show notes and to be a member of Mio's Miracle Mob. Because as the wise modern day philosopher John Bon Jovi once said, miracles happen every day. Change your perception of what a miracle is, and you'll see them all around you. 